Friends, if you would turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 12. If you don't have your Bibles, feel free to use one in the chair in front of you or open up your phones to Matthew 12. We're going to start reading in Matthew 12, verse 38, in just a couple of minutes. Now, many of you may recall, as we have gone through these last couple of chapters in Matthew's gospel, that the tension continues to rise between Jesus and his opponents. At the beginning of Matthew chapter 12, the disciples have confronted Jesus about uh, the day of Sabbath and Sabbath laws. His disciples had reached out and plucked grain and ate it, and the disciples confronted him about it on the Sabbath. Jesus heals a man with a withered hand, and the Pharisees confront him about it because he did it on the Sabbath day. And these things have amounted to too much for the Pharisees. And by the middle of chapter 12, they have decided to conspire together to destroy Jesus. And then the disciples see this incredible miracle, a demon-oppressed man given back his sight and his voice. And they call it the work of the enemy instead of the work of God. And Jesus talks about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And now we get to this passage, and it is rather incredible that by the time we get to the end of this chapter, the Pharisees and the enemies of Christ come to Him and they demand a sign from Him. They actually want some divine credentials now from Jesus Christ. It's a curious way to start a conversation here. But in response to that, Jesus actually does a couple of things in our passage today. Jesus draws distinction between those who oppose Him and those who become a part of His family. So in our passage today, Jesus is going to talk about what a wicked and adulterous generation demands. Now that looks a little bit like an incomplete sentence, but I left it there. The demand of a wicked and adulterous generation and in response to their demand, Jesus will say that they are going to be given, we are all going to be given, one piece of unshakable evidence for the divine claims of the truth of Jesus Christ and who He is. As Jesus continues to talk about this wicked and adulterous generation, He will talk about how these Pharisees and scribes and their desire is that they look good on the outside. There is a certain kind of strict conformity to external righteousness in the lives of the Pharisees, but on the inside there is nothing but destruction and decay. So Jesus will spend time talking about this wicked and adulterous generation. But then Jesus, based on what happens in these conversations, He will then begin to talk about this brand new family of faith that becomes available to whosoever will. We discover that there is something new and there is something powerful and there is something eternal offered to these folks and to us as well. What does it mean to become a part of the family of faith, especially as opposed to this wicked and adulterous generation? What's the difference between those who oppose Jesus and who, those who belong to His brand new family? Well, let's walk through this passage of Scripture. Let's begin by reading in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. It's an incredible conversation, and it begins with this surprising request, and Jesus just calls it a demand. Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. 
The word that the Pharisees use is a common word in the New Testament for a miraculous event, the fulfillment of prophecy. They want proof of his divinity, of his divine credentials. It's a surprising request, but it helps us understand what's going on in the hearts and lives of the Pharisees in this conversation between them. It's amazing in part because they've just seen this demon-oppressed man freed from all of these things. I mean, that's quite a sign. You don't see that one every day, but they watched it happen with Jesus and this man. And of course, we know that what they saw was the work of Beelzebul, the work of the enemy. Their reaction to the sign was, well, the devil did it. It wasn't really God. In that context now, they ask for miraculous proof for who Jesus says he is. When they ask this, when they demand this, I wonder, are they ready to accept and believe? Well, now if we really get a sign, Jesus will believe in you. No. They ask this, they demand this, but no, they're actually not ready to see a sign and believe. Do they think that they're being smart in building a case against Jesus Christ? Well, yes, that's actually what's going on here. In fact, a couple of other times in the Gospels when the Pharisees present something like this to Jesus, the Gospel writer will tell us they ask this in order to test Him or they ask this in order to get something from Him to condemn Him or to name Him as guilty before the Roman authorities. Michael Card, the artist, has written kind of a wonderful little devotional book on the four Gospels. And as he thinks about this passage in the Gospel of Matthew, He says this, and I think there's a lot of truth to this. He says, this demand of Jesus from the Pharisees and the scribes is evidence of a precondition of their heart not to believe. The demand that Jesus show them something is a precondition in their heart not to believe. Friends, I think there's a lot of truth to that. In fact, I think there's a lot of insight into the human heart in that, and it has been my experience that something like this is very true. When the human heart tries to put God on trial, it has already decided to deny all exonerating evidence. When the human heart walks before God with these kinds of demands, That human heart already believes God is guilty and cannot be proven innocent. Because in that moment, that human heart has approached God in a certain degree of superiority. I mean, can you imagine that? A human heart coming to God in a sense of superiority over Him. C.S. Lewis wrote a wonderful essay called God in the Dock. And I have to admit that when I was younger and I saw that title, I thought, well, that's interesting. God in a dinghy tied to a pier. I don't understand what he means by God in the dock. But he doesn't mean that. He means God sitting in the defendant's seat, sitting in the chair. The person who sits there might just be guilty. And what Lewis says is that the modern heart approaches God as if he is in the dock and he has to prove himself to me before maybe he'll be considered innocent and I will follow him. But we see something about that attitude of heart in the Pharisees. The approach of that kind of demand is actually the state of the heart that says, I'm just not going to believe whatever evidence is given. And that can be overcome over time through divine intervention and love and friendship and apologetic work, but... In that moment, there is that kind of arrogance. And they are not after believing in Christ. They think they're being smart in building a case against Him. Well, as they come to Him and they demand this, Jesus really comes down hard on them. And the longer the Gospel of Matthew goes, the more tense these conversations between the Pharisees and Jesus become. In fact, if you continue to read through this gospel, you'll come to a chapter where Jesus' entire sermon might be titled, You Scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites. (laughs) Over and over, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, hypocrites, hypocrites. But at this moment, Jesus comes on them and says this, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He calls them an evil and adulterous generation. They're an evil generation. They already have their theology and their morality completely upside down. They've observed the good work of God in someone's life and they've called it the work of the devil. So we know that there is evil inside of them in this way. But they're adulterous as well, and they're adulterous in the Old Testament sense of adultery. Jesus speaks like an Old Testament prophet at this moment. They were called to worship God in Him alone, but they have decided to worship other things besides God, and throughout Scripture, God sees that as spiritual adultery. The scribes and the Pharisees are not after worshiping God, they're after worshiping other things. But as Jesus speaks to them, He He essentially says, you know, I'm not going to play your game. I'm not going to play the magician for you. I'm not going to give you the kind of sign that you are seeking. But instead of that, there will be, in fact, one singular, incontrovertible, utterly unique sign, this piece of evidence that will be given to everybody about who I really am. And he says in this passage, in fact, this this sign will be so significant that those who were drawn to God by lesser things will rise up in the day of judgment and condemn you for not seeing this sign. The Ninevites heard the preaching of a reluctant prophet Jonah, and they repented, the whole city. In fact, the repentance was so complete that even the animals repented. You can go look it up. It's really there in the Bible. The queen of Sheba, the queen of Ethiopia, travels across a continent to get to Solomon to hear the wisdom of God. And Jesus says, but something greater is here. Something greater is here in Jesus Christ. So he says this, it will be the sign of the prophet Jonah. Well, there's one great big thing happening here as Jesus speaks of the sign of the prophet Jonah, but there's um, a couple of things happening inside of this sign. Remember very quickly the prophet Jonah. Jonah was called by God to speak a message of repentance to the Ninevites. God speaks to his man Jonah. Jonah politely declines God's request and runs the other direction. God gets his attention in a rather dramatic way and literally points Jonah back in the direction of Nineveh and spits him out in the direction of that city. And at that point, Jonah decides to go ahead and accept God's request. (laughs) He makes his way to the city of Nineveh, preaches through it, and the whole city repents and turns around. Well, God gets Jonah's attention by swallowing him inside of a great fish, and he spends three days inside of that great fish, and then he spit up on the shoreline, and he sent off to the city of Nineveh. These are the marks, Jesus says, of his divine credentials. The message of repentance as Jonah was sent to give, but then even more significantly, the, the sign of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Just as Jonah was in the belly of that whale for three days and three nights, so will Son of Man, so I'll be in the heart of the earth for three days. Now remember Jesus' first sermon, this message of repentance. The very first thing that Jesus speaks to the crowds in Matthew and in Mark is very simple, and it's this, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the very core of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are able now to, we are called now to turn from our old way of life and enter into this brand new kingdom of heaven that is being brought into our presence by Jesus Christ and now filled and empowered by His Holy Spirit, right? Jesus is here, and there's new life available for all who repent, and this has been Jesus' message in so many ways. But then, especially the sign of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It stands, as Jesus says here, as this one unique, singular sign that God in human flesh willingly goes to his death on the cross for my sins, and he walks out of the grave three days later and is alive. Jesus did not rise from the dead metaphorically. Jesus did not rise from the dead spiritually. 
Jesus walked out of the grave. The stone was rolled away so that physical body could walk out of that grave, and he is still alive. This is the sign that will be given to absolutely everybody. And it's at the very center, the core of our faith, of our belief, of our trust in who Jesus is. So thinking about the resurrection throughout the Gospel of Matthew, we'll have a chance to talk about the resurrection and how it works and what it means, but I want us to just read briefly two passages of Scripture in the epistles, passages that the Apostle Paul uses to talk about the importance of the resurrection. One comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 17, Paul says this, And if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead." If the resurrection is a teaching that we have and hold to and we believe in, but it didn't really happen, this is ridiculous and a waste of time. But in fact, Jesus rose from the dead. New life is given to all who believe in him. Paul says in another place in Romans chapter 10, in verse 9, a verse that we speak often from behind this pulpit Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Belief in the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is right at the center of our saving faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is an extraordinary claim, but it is a claim that is filled with the evidence for its truth. It's not just a claim that is made and you and I are asked to believe it blindly and without thought and reflection, but it is a belief that is filled with the evidence for its truth. Again, two more passages of Scripture back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Listen to how Paul begins his conversation about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in according with the Scriptures and was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve, and then He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, then to the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, He appeared also to me." Paul says this, look, what I've received as first importance to my faith is the resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures. And so that's the very first thing I gave you. And it was more than just a piece of doctrine I wanted you to believe. We know he's alive because he walked out of that grave and he showed up to this person and to these people and he showed up to a giant crowd of people as alive and then he even showed up to me as well. And then I love what Paul sticks in there. He says, now some of them are dead but I want you to know that a lot of them are still alive. I'm appealing to eyewitness. You can confirm what I have said with people who are still walking around here on earth. There's one more quick passage. I just love this kind of stuff from Matthew chapter 28. At the end of this book, we get this interesting glimpse into the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how it struck his enemies, those who wanted him dead, became worried that he had actually come alive. 28 verse 11, When they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests what had taken place. In other words, the angel shows up, the stone was rolled away, and the body is gone. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Who knew where Jesus was buried? The Romans and the Jewish leaders. Who had reason to produce a corpse in order to squash the early Christian movement? The Romans and the early Jewish leaders. 
Who could not, in fact, produce the corpse of Jesus Christ to stop the early Christian movement? The Romans and the Jewish leaders. Why? Because he really is alive. He really walked out of the grave. Jesus predicts in this passage, and he introduces this notion in Matthew's Gospel in this special way here in this conversation. He predicts his resurrection from the dead. And their relationship to him will actually hinge on their reaction to this one single sign. These others repented it less. They are given the Son of God Himself in His resurrection, and they will be condemned for their refusal to believe in Jesus Christ. You see, as Jesus has been telling us, though, this disbelieving evil group of people will be content instead with what they can concoct inside of their lives. And Jesus, in our next little passage, goes straight to their own notion of self-management and self-righteousness. They are doing everything they can to sweep their own house clean. So let's read what Jesus says in this next passage of Scripture. Beginning in verse 43. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty and swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. An unclean spirit is swept out. It returns to find the house clean and put in order, and it realizes There's room now for more of us in this soul, so I'm bringing my friends and we're moving right back in. That's an interesting thing for Jesus to say. Now, we already know that the Pharisees are in the control of these profound falsehoods. It was called blasphemy against the Holy Spirit in our previous passage. We also know that the Pharisees are absolutely obsessed with their moralistic legalism the moralistic legalism of their lives and of the lives of other people. They're interested in you being a legalist. That's what it means to be a Pharisee in part. So what Jesus says is that they and their generation have actually only made more room in their lives for the work of the enemy. You combine those things. Refusal to believe in Jesus Christ, the attempt to make myself righteous, And Jesus says, you haven't made yourself righteous. You've actually opened the door for even more activity from the enemy. It's an amazing thing to say. And friends, it leads us to an important reality inside of this heart. Instead of this kind of self-management, instead of this kind of self-help, instead of this kind of self-righteousness, my life needs to be filled with the Spirit of God. I cannot make myself righteous by sweeping my house clean and putting things in order. Jesus says that's not how righteousness works. But instead, I have to be filled with the Spirit of God. I love this image that comes to us from an old curmudgeonly Scottish theologian. I know that's redundant, but I love it. His name was George MacDonald, and he said this. He said, you know, when we get saved, when we come to Christ, what we envision is is that we our house is pretty much in order. It's mostly clean. We've got things in their place, and we've swept the hearth. And when Jesus comes in, he sees a few other things that need to be fixed, and he makes good people better, and our house is even more sparkly and shiny. But we grow really uncomfortable when God walks into our house and starts knocking down walls and digging up the foundation. I don't bring to him a house that's already in good shape. I bring to him a broken heart that needs to be completely remade. It's not my self-righteousness. It's that God needs to show up here and start all over again and rebuild the foundation and rebuild his house inside of my life. Legalism, my attempts to make myself righteous may sweep it clean, but I have to be filled with the Spirit of God. I love... 
The way Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 5, it's verse 18. He says, instead of being filled with the things of this world, you need to be continually filled over and over again with the Spirit of God. Right? Be filled over and over with the Spirit of God. But this evil generation has no use for the gift of the kingdom of God. So instead, this evil generation becomes filled with the work of the enemy. So Jesus now, as he is in this conversation with the Pharisees, he's addressing what this evil and adulterous generation is like, what is sitting inside of their hearts, their demands of God, what is going on inside of them as they attempt these efforts at self-righteousness. But now, because of how the conversation churns, Jesus moves from talking about an evil and adulterous generation now to a brand new family. So he's contrasting now what is new and available in Jesus Christ. And again, he does it in a rather surprising way. Verse 46. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mothers and brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my brother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward the disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and my mother. Wherever Jesus is physically, the room is packed, it's full. His biological family shows up and they want to see him. As other Gospels tell us this story, they were worried about him and they're trying to get to him. And so word comes to Jesus, your mother and your brothers, they're all outside waiting for you. And in response to that, Jesus asks a question. And he does this often. Jesus takes a situation that seems to be moving in this direction, and then he asks a question or he says something that takes it and moves it in a completely unexpected direction. Now, to me, there's a degree of humor here. You have to sort of put yourself in the shoes of a man who brings word to Jesus. So his mother and brother outside, go tell Jesus we're out here and we need to see him. He makes his way through the crowd. He comes up to Jesus and he goes, your mother and your brother are outside waiting for you. Jesus goes, who are my mother and my brothers? The guy is thinking, I literally don't know how to answer that question. You know them, right? They're outside waiting for you. But Jesus uses this opportunity Begin to talk about family. He uses this opportunity to begin to talk about people that he is pulling into such an intimate relationship with him that he calls these people brother and sister. We learn in the scripture that we have been adopted as children into the family of God. So Jesus takes this opportunity of this whole conversation. That's an evil and adulterous generation. And now he says, but this is my family. This is who belongs to me. I had the privilege of growing up in church, and I grew up inside of a Pentecostal church and group of people. And, you know, as a little kid, the people who were a couple of generations older than me, they called everybody brother and sister. It's a great way to talk to somebody if you've forgotten their name or you don't know if they're a visitor, brother or sister, right? I have to admit that as a little kid, I thought that just seems, that feels so old to me. But the more I have walked this walk of faith, the more I have spent time with the church of God, the more precious the language of brother and sister has come to me. God makes us his children. He makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. That's what he does here physically. He points to his disciples. This is now my family of faith. This family of faith are those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Friends, the family of faith does not supplant the biological family, but it becomes a new kind of family that is founded on Jesus Christ. 
That is what holds us together. Whether you like it or not, that's what holds us together for the rest of eternity. Is that this has become a brand new family founded on Jesus Christ. The foundation that cannot be shaken and cannot be moved. This notion of the family of faith is so important to the New Testament writers that they use all kinds of vocabulary to talk about the church and they use the vocabulary of language and, excuse me, the vocabulary of a family and household and children and brothers and sisters. A couple of these passages, listen to how Paul talks about it in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, as he's talking about the unity of believers in Jesus Christ, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Out there, you're stratified. Out there, you've been placed in a cubicle. And if you look like this, you belong over there. If you do this job, you belong over here. If you're this gender, you belong over there. They've been placed like that in the world outside of the church. But Paul says, here, that doesn't belong. We've all become members of the household of God. It's a powerful thing that happens inside of the church. And then a page over in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We actually bear special responsibility to each other as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. It strikes me as important that Matthew's very first readers, as they hear Jesus say this, many of them were running the risk of straining their family ties or even severing their family ties in order to follow Jesus Christ. But they've made the decision to follow Christ, and that may get strained. Some of that might even get severed. They hear Jesus, the Creator of the universe, the lover of their souls, their perfect elder brother. They hear Him say, this is now my family. You belong here. What a powerful thing for the children of God to hear. So this family of faith is a brand new thing founded on Jesus Christ. And then Jesus tells us something that's so important inside of that passage. He says this family of faith is of those who obey. We have seen that belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is critical. It's central to our faith in Jesus Christ. And now Jesus tells us that Acting like a member of the family is also important. As children, we now are bearing the image of our Heavenly Father. Are we acting like it? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Are we behaving now like this brand new family that we have been given? We are all on this journey together. And Christ's life is growing inside of us. And we are called, in fact, not just to obey but to encourage each other in our obedience as we do this together. A couple more passages of Scripture. I know this is a lot of Scripture, but I was just having a great time reading these things. Nobody stopped me, so here we go. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Let us think about what it means as brothers and sisters in Christ to encourage each other to obey Christ the way that He has called us to do so. Let's think about that. Let's work on that with each other. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 and 13, Therefore lift up your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. This is our disposition toward each other, and it is. We're not here to crush you in your failure, in your stumbling, or in your fault. We are here to lift you up. We are here to restore the broken soul. This notion of obedience and how it belongs to all of us is not new to us in Matthew's Gospel. 
Jesus has already told us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, look, if you're the kind of person who hears my words and does them, you're like the wise man who has built his house upon the rock. The storm will come and the waves will beat against that house. But because of your obedience, it will stand. It's beautiful what Christ gives us when He talks about obedience. Friends, obedience is a glimpse into our allegiances. It's a glimpse into our allegiance. I belong to the family of God. I belong to this brand new kingdom, this powerful kingdom. We've gone through the Sermon of, on the Mount, which is this intensified version of the kingdom of God and what now is new and different inside of our lives because of it. I belong to that. So now my life learns to follow in that, to walk in that, to actually obey in that. Am I aligned with the truths of Jesus Christ? Is my lifestyle aligned with the values and the priorities of Christ in His kingdom? I love this thought about obedience. Jesus, and this phrase we don't use very often, but I like it. Jesus, our perfect elder brother, as He walked here on this earth, He obeyed. There's this beautiful passage in Hebrews chapter 5 that says that Jesus actually perfected obedience even through His suffering, His suffering on the cross. But because of that obedience, he has now become the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So as we obey, we even follow in the path of Jesus Christ. And then, friends, as we kind of put together all that's happened inside of this passage, our obedience to Christ is the exact opposite of the demands that the broken human heart place on God. In fact, obedience, when we learn how to walk humbly before our God in submission to who He truly is and what His Word says is real about my life, obedience becomes this kind of antidote to a demanding spirit. I learn to let that go and walk humbly before my Lord. In demanding of God, there is so much dysfunction inside of the human heart and mind. It is inherently selfish. But in obedience, there is freedom. In obedience, there is the freedom of being able to let go of all that I have tried to control and work and manipulate, and now walking before my God, a good, loving, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing God, who is the judge of all, the Lord of history, and who will draw His church into Himself. There is freedom in obedience to Jesus Christ. And there is freedom, friends, in living inside of the family of God. Let's pray.